What's up, people? Welcome to Hustle is for Life Motivation. This is the show where you come every single week uh, to get inside the minds of the top thought leaders, of top experts, so we can learn from them and create a holistic level of success in our lives. Today, I'm joined by somebody who is a persuasive communication expert. And he uh, will be sharing with us his, his ideas, his thoughts, um, and uh, his, his some really powerful concepts around how we can persuade without manipulating. Um, and it's, it's, he's very focused on the fact that this is one of the most important skills that you need to master. I totally agree. Um, and I believe that it's one of the most underrated skills. So my question to you at the start is really, when you are talking to somebody, it doesn't matter what capacity that is in, whether that is in a professional capacity, whether that's at home, in your personal life, your friend, your neighbor, when you're talking to them, how often do you have to persuade them? Well, first of all, let me say thanks for allowing me to be on your show today. <laughs> I appreciate this opportunity. I'm excited to talk. So my big statement is that we all live or die based upon our ability to persuade. So to me, it doesn't matter if you're the CEO of a company moving it forward, if you are in sales, if you're a sales manager, if you're in middle management, if you're an entrepreneur, if you don't want to live alone for the rest of your life, that we all live or die based upon our ability to persuade. And I think it transcends all of our life. So this isn't just about our professional world. For example, I'm married and for my spouse, I have to be able to persuade. I also am the father of three children, right? So I have to be able to persuade there. I deal with clients, I deal with neighbors. I think all of our life is about persuasion. Absolutely, you're so right. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter who you're talking to or in what capacity you're having an interaction with another person. The fact is at some point you will have to persuade them. Now, whether that's stopping your kids from jumping on the bed and brushing their teeth and so because it's bedtime, or whether it is convincing your spouse that actually no, those teal curtains look hideous. We are not gonna buy <laughs> teal curtains. Or whether that's asking for your boss for a raise, right? For a salary increase. Uh, whatever it is, you are persuading people on a daily basis. So it's a very important skill to have. So Jeff, I know you are an international speaker. You're a published author. You work with some really big names like Airbnb um, and the League of uh, Women's Voters and the League of Conservation Voters. You have a, already published a book and you've got a second one in the running um, and you travel everywhere spreading this message of persuasive communication without manipulation. So tell me a little bit about your story. How did you get started down this path and where, where do you actually came across this whole concept of persuasive communication and how it's impacted you? So the real genesis for me understanding persuasive communication versus manipulation came uh, through an adoption. Mm. It was something that I was not expecting. It was not a dream of mine. It was not this lifelong goal to adopt a baby. It was random. It was unexpected. It was like the universe just dropped it in my lap and I had this calling that I felt like I was to proceed forward. And it was one of those blind things, like sometimes like we are with entrepreneurs, like we just like, we take it on and we're gonna run, we're gonna make things happen. My father had gone to Haiti to do some humanitarian relief and he came back and was telling me the story uh, of his work there. And in particular, he told me about a ninth grade girl who was the interpreter for his group that went over there. And she happened to be in an English speaking American Christian school and got pregnant. And the school gave her a choice. They said, you can either get rid of your baby or you can drop out of school. Wow. I don't know about you, but I can't even imagine what that was like, like making that decision, like what emotions you go through, what the mental process is like that you go through. But that was a choice that was given to her. And I look at this picture of her having dinner with my father and I looked in this baby and I looked into her eyes and I just knew that I was to move forward that I was to be the one that was to become her father and I needed to make this happen. So that was the beginning of the story. And I'll tell you, my time in Haiti was crazy. I had never had a gun held at my head before. I had never had a machete held at my neck. I had never had to flee a city for my own safety. What I didn't know was that Aristide, the president, his government was collapsing and the whole country was in riots, similar to things that are going on right now in Haiti. So I, I go over to, to Haiti. It's 
culture shock, it's language, it's like there's all types of barriers there. But here's here was my aha moment as I began to understand the difference between manipulation and persuasion. I was about four or five months into the, the process uh, of adoption, and I received an email from my Haitian attorney. And he said, Jeff, the office that you need to have this next document signed, the worker's not showing up to work. It's just shut down. I don't know that they're coming back. At best, maybe you should consider your adoption on hold. But at worst, you might need to accept that your adoption is over. Mm. Well, I was devastated. You know, I, here I was. I'd already been over there. I had fallen in love with this little girl. And so I, I go to bed depressed, get the next morning, decide I'm going to fly to Haiti buy a ticket, I head over. And this was my plan of action. I decided I was going to go over and with my translator, walk from my attorney's office, his home, um, to the, the office that, where I needed to go. So every day, the interpreter and I, we got up and we walked over. I went over optimistic. You know, the sun comes up, you're all pumped up. I walked back at the end of the day, deflated once again because they didn't show up. And so once again, nothing could happen. Till finally, one day, the office person showed up that I needed help from. Wow. And here's what happened. You can imagine, like, all this stuff is bouncing around in my head. All these emotions, fears, concern, I'm worried, I, I'm afraid things are falling apart. I didn't have many English-speaking pe people during this two-week window, so like, I got all this stuff you know, bottled up inside of me. So when I first start talking to him through my interpreter, I just, like, let it all out. <laughs> and I'm just going on and on and on. And I'm using words like I, me, and my constantly. I'm saying things like, I need you to, to sign this document. I need to complete this adoption for my daughter. And I need you to do this now. And would you believe he looked at me and said, no. Wow. And he wasn't going to do it. And I had to turn this thing around very quickly. So I drew on what I knew of Haitian culture, the limited knowledge that I had. And what I did know was this. They loved their babies. They loved their children. They viewed them as jewels or precious to them. So here's what I did. I turned the conversation around in mere seconds here. And I made it about her. And I made it about this person. And I looked at him and I said, I know how much you value your children. I'm willing to give this young girl a home. She doesn't have money. She doesn't have anyone to pay. She's in an orphanage at that point. Doesn't have anyone to pay. She doesn't have a promise of education. I will do that if you will sign this for me. And mm. he turned immediately. Ten minutes it was signed. I was out of there. And I began you know, going back to the, to the house, began trying to analyze what happened. And here's what had happened. I went from manipulation, which is trying to make him do what I want him to do, because I said so, to finding his win and why he should do it, and I spoke to his values. And that was my aha moment of understanding manipulation versus persuasion. Hmm. Yeah, that's such a beautiful and powerful story, and I'm glad you shared it with us. But also the fact that in that story is a very powerful message of manipulation versus persuasion. Um, and a lot of the times you're right. We, we get into that. We get into like, this is what I want. Do it for me. You know, I, I want this. I want that. Um, I told you so. That's a big one, right? I told you so. Yes. Yeah. So it's, it is really um, a different mindset where you are actually trying to find the win for the other person as well. You're approaching it from a persuasion angle rather than a manipulation angle. Absolutely. And I think that you know, in my opinion, when people catch this, when they really understand the difference, it will change their mindset. It will set them free because I believe that persuasion is actually leadership. Persuasion mm -hmm. is seeing how things could be better, how they could be different, and not twisting people's arms to pull them along, but you know, creating it inside of them. Here's how, here's how I define it. So manipulation looks like this. Manipulation looks like controlling or trying to make things happen from another person, to do, but doing it cleverly, to do it unfairly. So in manipulation and persuasion, they're both alike in that we're trying to move people. But what happens in manipulation, we move them out of our own self-interest. We move them out of what is best for us. Now, Let's contrast that. Persuasion means this. It means to call someone to do something, but to do it through reasoning or argument. 
And the word here, argument, isn't what happens around you know, Christmas or Thanksgiving or, or whatever when we're having all these political discussions and religious discussions and we're biting each other's heads off. It's not that. What I'm talking about here is the original sense of the word where people share their value, what's important to them, what they're looking for. And then over a sustained period of time, what ends up happening there, we provide sound reasoning. And the audience comes along and they're in the same place that we're in. And I look for two magical words. And if I hear these two words, I know that I persuaded and I didn't manipulate. And those two words are, that's right. So mm. when I finish talking to a potential client and we're ready to sign the contract and that client looks at me and says, hey, Jeff, that's right. Your firm is the right solution for this problem that we have. Jeff, you can fix this. Or if I'm meeting with a meeting planner, they say, Jeff, that's right. You are the speaker that can bring value to our audience. You are the one that we want to put on stage. Here's what it tells me. They want it for themselves just as much as I want it, right? That's persuasion. Who doesn't want to be in a place like that? It doesn't matter if I'm dealing with a spouse, kids, or whatever. When the, my audience wants it for themselves as much as I do, we're in a great place. Mm, I love it. So, Jeff, my question is, can you persuade any person, any type of person? Or do you think that the other person actually also need to have a certain mindset? They also need to have a certain understanding of what persuasion is. Great question. Um, and um, you, in, the, in the book, I don't go into to this question, but the answer is, I don't think it's always best to persuade. Mm. Here's why. How many times have we tried to make something happen, we make it happen only to find out it's not what we want and it's really not the best for us. So what I, in, in my experience, I lay it out there, I follow, like as I lay out my book, I, I go everything from messaging, you know, all the way to trust, I go through the whole spectrum. But then at that point, we're dealing with another human being, not a robot. They have to make a choice for them. And guess what? If it's not the right choice for them, if it's not the right decision, I wanna know it right now. Right. And that's what persuasion is about. That's not causing them to do something because I want them to do something. It's because they want it. If they don't, fantastic. It was great meeting you. Have a wonderful life. Let me know if I can do anything for you. We don't mm. want it then. Let it go. Mm. Let it go. Yeah. <laughs> Let it go. The, the immortal words from Frozen. <laughs> oh my. Are we really quoting Frozen here today? <laughs> <laughs> I think you just did. We just did. <laughs> uh, I feel like I should apologize for that. <laughs> <laughs> we went there. We did go there. <laughs> awesome. So, Jeff, this persuasion, um, does that actually work on people of particular age? Or does that work uh, with people of all ages? Like, can you, can you persuade a three-year-old? Or maybe do you think, can you persuade an 80-year-old, somebody who, you know, is usually seen by society as who's someone, uh, they're set in their ways. They are, you know, very, very rigid and not very flexible. So I would say for the most part, yes, it works. And I'm going to go back to what you just said. You said that they're set in their ways. And then let's go back to my definition of persuasion is we're, we're making sure that we align with what it is that they want for themselves as well. Yeah. So when we find that alignment, even people that seem to be set in their ways, when those ways align, then we can move forward um, together. And, and a big part of this is, you know, we can discuss you know, more in depth later if you want, but it's, it's around listening, right? It's around understanding the other person. So many times if we're in sales we're all about the product benefits, the services that we can give, like all the specifications. Um, instead of understanding, going back to the person and understanding what the need is, like where's the gap? And most times there's a gap in health, wealth, and relationships. So where's the gap? What's going on here? And can I bring a solution to that? We don't know if we don't take time to first listen. And too, too many times, too often, we're out there pimping ourselves and our own story instead of listening to the other person to understand what it is that they're looking for. Mm, yeah, no, I totally understand. Um, but you, you talked about their, you know, having engagement. You have to engage with the other person. You have to listen to them. I think they're very, very important, both engagement and listening to them. But what if there's no engagement from the other person? What do you do in that scenario? So when I'm in, uh, and I have a section, a chapter of my book where I, I discuss this. If I'm face to face, if I'm on the stage, how, wherever I happen to be working with other people, I seek as soon as possible 
to make a connection with the other person. Mm. Like finding some common ground to make a connection. And there's several tools that, that I offer in the book to help people make a connection. Because I, th I think if you can make that connection, even people that are a little hesitant to open up and share will be more likely. Again, we're not dealing with a robot. We're not programming something. We're dealing with another human being, and that's extremely important to me. But there are some tools that we can use to help make a connection. Uh, for example, humor. Humor is a fantastic mm. way to make connection with another human being, especially if you're in sales, right? People are like, they have the walls are built up. They've got all this stuff holding them back. If we can just laugh together a little bit, it changes everything. I think it's so valuable. I'm in the middle of a 10 week class now on writing and performing stand up comedy. I think laughing is that important to us. And oftentimes we do get so stressed out. We get so busy in our life and in our worlds and all that's going on that we don't pause to laugh. And when we can get people to laugh, we can help make a connection. Another is to, is compassion, like having compassion for another human being. And again, like we talk about listening, if you haven't listened, you can't have compassion, right? Because you don't even know what they're going through, what's happening in their world. And, and compassion could be for you know, great high things that are happening in their world, or maybe they're celebrating, maybe their father just died, or maybe their kid is extremely sick, or you know, maybe their business is struggling, you know, or maybe they're having something with their spouse. And again, you know, we can't make people say what they won't say, and we can only take this connection to the point that the audience is willing to make but what I'm saying is the person who is persuading to give people as many opportunities as possible. So compassion, or how about a level deeper than compassion? What about empathy? What about mm. not only understanding what they're going through, but what about feeling it for yourself? And that's part of life. Like when we've gone through some of these struggles in our lives, when we've been in relationships that weren't going well, we could feel it with that person. And if we can let them know that we feel the pain that they're going through, we feel it intently as well. It helps us to make a connection there. Storytelling is another great way to, to make a connection. Look how we started your show today. You asked me to tell the story of my Haitian adoption. What does that do? It connects you, right? We're connected now. I'm connected to your audience um, as well. And the fifth tip that I offer in the book um, is authentic authenticity being authentic with our audience. And we do that by asking questions. We, we do that by acknowledging our own mistakes. When I speak on my mistakes from the stage, people like that a whole lot better than they like my successes. So just being open, guess what? I make mistakes. I make mistakes every single day. I can laugh at myself, I can share them with you, and it frees you up to connect with me. Um, and then also making sure that we're present in the conversation with other people. Putting our phones down, right? looking at people eye to eye, having that, that connection with them there. So I think that to your point and your question here, if we can make that connection with people, it'll catapult our ability to persuade them. Mm, yeah. Yeah. That's very powerful. And I love those, love those tips that you offered there. I think they're really, really powerful. Um, all of them. I've, I've, I've wrote them all down. Um, and uh, for the people in the audience, I hope you've been taking notes. I always take notes during every single call. I've you been taking notes. Uh, but if you didn't catch that, it was humor, compassion, empathy, storytelling, and being authentic and talking about your mistakes. And that's how you build that connection and that instant rapport with anybody. And then you will be able to persuade them. That's excellent. So Jeff, there are times where you are trying to persuade somebody um, to do something. So it might be, let's say you want to ask your boss for a raise, right? Um, you might be convincing your spouse to go to this family thing that they really don't want to go to because, you know, last time that happened, uh, some, some things were said or things happened and it, it just blew up. So whatever it is, you're, you're trying to persuade them to do this thing for you. So a lot of the times people do have this thing where they feel like, I, I feel maybe I am manipulating here. I don't, I, but I don't want to be manipulated. I feel dirty. So what advice do you have for those people? I, again, I point back to making sure that we're aligning with, with the person and what they're after um, as well. I do have in the book, I talked through three tips on how you position your, your message there. Um, and in the book, I talk through like crafting the message. I give like all the, all the early work that you need to do. This is especially important in business or if you're writing landing pages, if you're writing sales copy or 
whatever. I talk about like how to craft it. But part of what I talk about in the book is how you position your message to get people to say yes. And again, this isn't a silver bullet. Understand we're working with humans. So we have to understand that there are all kinds of variables. But let me give you three tips on positioning the message that I think will be helpful to you and to your audience. Um, the first one is, is understanding loss aversion versus prospect theory. Loss mm -hmm. aversion versus prospect theory. Here's what, here's what that means. So in general, most likely, people would respond more quickly if you told them they're going to lose $1,000 out of their checking account versus you're going to give them $1,000. We don't like losing. Now, some people do respond more to prospect. I'll give you that. But generally speaking, loss aversion will convert. People will, will say yes much more sooner by using loss aversion. So think through what it is you're trying to communicate. If the person doesn't move forward with where you're going, what is the loss that can be felt? Mm. So again, we're not manipulating them. These, this is a reality, right? This is what's going to happen. We're not, we're not creating some fake scenario to manipulate them. This is what's going to happen. If you don't do this, here's, here's what could happen, right? So talk through the loss, what a person could lose, not what they're going to gain. The second one is understanding the difference between um, asking people through emotion versus logic. Keeping in mind that people don't buy for logical reasons. They buy for emotional reasons. And Zig Ziglar was the king who taught us that. So what we know here is that let's speak to an emotion. Right? Love, hate, anger, whatever that emotion happens to be. Like figure out what, that, what the emotion is uh, and speak to the emotion versus just the logic. That's extremely important when you're talking about like getting a raise as well, right? Like let's speak to the emotion, pull out the emotion of what you're doing. The third one, and this one is this one is great. A lot of people don't think don't think through it, through things this way. The the third one is this, is is understanding the difference between binary and non-binary options. Mm. Sometimes we think every decision is yes, no, one or two, true or false. But if we think creatively and we think a little differently, most likely we can look at some non-binary options, which will help you know, a person like that get the other person get what they want and you get what you want as well. For example, with the raise, maybe the company can't give you the raise immediately. So maybe there is, instead of give me a raise or I'm quitting, maybe there's incremental steps of getting to where you want to be. Maybe there are other approaches. Maybe you have a side hustle that is like really picking up and you would kind of like to pull back a little bit and have a little extra few hours here and there to be able to to do your side hustle. Maybe that's another way to move forward. So the point with it, the, the third one here is, it's don't look just for yes or no, black or white. Be creative. Are there other possibilities, other realms in which we could find a way to move together? Does that make sense? Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I think one of the uh, times where persuasive communication um, is very necessary but a lot of the times it doesn't take place is during networking events yes. would you agree with that jeff yeah yeah absolutely i mean we've got so much that's, that's happening in, in our spaces and networking uh, and, and i'm glad you brought that up because i i love using this example um as we talk about like, like messaging and networking events um we oftentimes practice like this 30 60 90 second elevator pitch you know, about ourselves um, and I say that 30 seconds is way too long. It's way too much of mm -hmm. a conversation for, for a person. Um, and this is part of what I talk about in the chapter of crafting a simple message. Here's what I do. When people say, Jeff, what do you do for a living? I say this. I say I speak professionally. And I quit. I pause. I don't go on for five minutes about all my accomplishments and all of my clients and all the places I've spoken. I don't. I simply say I speak professionally. Almost 100% of the time, you know what people say back to me next? Oh, well, what do you speak about, Jeff? Mm. And I say, oh, well, I speak on persuasive communications. At which point, you know, nine times out of ten, they'll come back and say, oh, you teach people how to manipulate for a living. And we laugh and I get into <laughs> the difference. Yeah. But here's what I'm after. I'm not after 30 to 60, 90 seconds of your time. I want to say three or four words that whet your appetite that pull you into this conversation with me, that make you ask me questions out of your own curiosity. Now you are bought into my story and that's the beginning of persuasion. Mm. So what I'm hearing you say there, Jeff, is that in all of 
the things we have discussed so far. The most important thing behind persuasive communication is being purposeful so you can create the alignment. So two words there, being purposeful in creating the alignment. That's the message that I'm getting from you. Is that, is that right, Jeff? Perfect. Beautiful. You can speak for me from stage next time. You got it covered. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can do we can do a team one. Maybe we can just tag oh, team in. Yeah, tag I'd team. be all over it. <laughs> <laughs> we can tag team it. Awesome, that's fantastic. But yeah, I think your the whole thing between um, persuasive communication um, is the fact that you do have to be very purposeful with what you are saying. You have to be very purposeful with how you're going to approach the other person and build that connection with them. So you can earn their trust. You can get them to, you know, lower their de defenses and you can actually engage in a deeper conversation with them. Yes. And I would add this one on there too. In fact, I have a chapter on this as well, that you have to care about your audience. Mm. You have to really care about them. You have to want what's best for your audience. You have to want what's best for the other person. And if it's not, if it's if the best thing is not moving forward, fantastic. Like we, we've learned that, but you know, Zig Ziglar said it this way. He said that we'll get everything in life we want if we just help enough other people get what they want in life. Mm. And I fully believe that, that it is not like we're like killing ourselves for other people. We have to put our own oxygen mask on first, right? We got to take care of ourselves. You know, we, we, there are things that we need in deals and, and things like that, but making sure that our mindset and our focus is on helping other people. When I step on the stage to speak to a group of people, what is not on my mind is the check that I received from that organization for coming and speaking, thinking about putting in my bank account and what I can do with it. Don't even think about it. Do I get paid to speak? Yeah, absolutely. I've got bills to pay myself. But when I step on that stage, what I care about, I care about bringing energy and passion to my audience so that I can rev them up, that I can motivate them as well. I care about delivering actionable content that can change their life, that they can leave my the seminar, leave my keynote, and their life can head in a brand new direction there. And then I seek to make sure that I have an emotional connection with them as well, that, that we're bonded in that moment together. And that's what I'm thinking about on stage. Mm. It's not about me getting a check. It's about me helping the audience. And I think this is a huge mind shift, mind shift set that could change. If we move away from, I need to get paid, I need to get my check, and, and put our mindset on, what does my audience need? I care about you. I want the very best for you. I want the best for your life. Now, how can with what I have to offer, what I sell or what I do, how can I help you get there? Mm, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, I'll just quickly dish, share this with you, Jeff. I know that you are a professional speaker. Um, I identified that public speaking is one of my weaknesses. So what I did was I joined my local Toastmasters group. So Yay. I can go and, and, and practice there. Um, and one of the things I discovered was that uh, initially I was actually very nervous and I found it quite hard to, you know, remember my speech off my heart and put, you know, string words into sentences and all sorts of other stuff. Um, and, and I'm, just because I was really nervous. And one of the things I've found that really helped me calm down my nerves and be in control was just the fact that I, I went there and I was like, I'm not thinking about, oh, what these people are thinking about me and how I'm going to mess up and when I'm going to, you know, forget my speech and what will I do at that point and all those things. And I'm thinking about, well, how's my speech going to impact that one person in the audience today? and how their life will change if I share just this one message. And if I really focus on that, I've, I've, it's, this is crazy. But seriously, I found that I have, I, I, I'm not nervous at all. I'm actually very calm. I'm actually more in control because I want to change that person's life. I want to help them. So I, I deliver my speech with more, with more substance behind it. Yes, when we set our intention and we intentionally set our intention to help other people, it does free us up. It frees us up mentally. And you know what? If we miss a word, if we miss a phrase, but our life has changed and a person heads in a new direction and they can you know, seek a raise or they can get what they need to go get a new job or they can change their relationship. If we mess up a word or two or if we skip a phrase or we mess up a point, does it really matter? Mm. It really doesn't matter. What matters is the person. They're not going to care. If they know that we're on stage and we care about them and we really want them to succeed and we're here to give them everything, they could care less. And that does free us up. You know, I've messed up before. I just laugh. 
so what? I'm human. Laughed. Here we go. Let's pick it back up again. Let's keep going. Mm, yeah. But putting that focus on other people. And that, that's the same thing if we're dealing with our spouses as well. If we're in a relationship, if we're dealing with our children as well, I mean, how many times do we come with our kids and we're just telling them what they need to do and we never listen to them about where they are in life and what they're looking for in life and why maybe even if they made a decision, why they made that bad decision? Why not listen to them as well or with our boss or, or, or coworkers, whatever that happens to be. If we, if our focus is on them, helping them and caring for them, they're going to know that we care and it's going to increase our ability to help persuade as it relates to different areas of our lives. Yeah, absolutely. And Jeff, uh, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, the relationship with the spouse. And I think definitely one of the times where you, you feel really anxious, you feel really nervous, um, and, and you really need to be on your game with persuasive communication um, is the time where you pop the question. Right. Like that's that's one of the times in your life where just like, you know, everything, <laughs> everything kind of comes into play. Everything's on, on the table and you're popping that question. Um, you know, you're 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 asking your significant other to 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 marry you. And I think that is one of the times where persuasive communication really comes into play. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I've did it. I've been married twice now, so I've done it twice and made it. <laughs> well, you you've done it successfully twice, so that's fantastic. <laughs> maybe you can maybe you can share with the rest of us the the secret formula. <laughs> so yeah, I I think that's that's a that's a really um, important time, and I think it's usually it's times like that where there's a lot on the table, where persuasive communication. Um, is 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 really important like like in your case when you were there trying to adopt your daughter there's a lot at stake and a life was, was at stake yeah exactly a life was a, was at stake i mean so haitian law here's the thing like haitian law requires when you go through this process that the mother has to sign off this a certificate of abandonment of her child and place the child in what's called a crush. It's basically like a halfway house orphanage. And so the mother totally releases the child. This child is in this crush. I'm the one paying for her to be there. And if I don't continue paying, if I don't take care of her, she has nothing. She literally has nothing, no one to care for her in her entire life. That's how much is weighing of every single decision that I made when I was there. Wow. That is powerful that is really powerful that's crazy um but yeah i mean it, it's such a powerful story but i think we, we keep going back to that simply because it, it is really powerful and the message behind it of that persuasive communication that actually to to achieve what you really want when the stakes are really high then you really need to think about how you can create that alignment how you can be more purposeful with your approach, how you can build that rapport, how you can actually create a win-win situation. And that is what persuasive communication really is. Yes, absolutely. Those are the, the foundation. Those are the basics. Absolutely. Agree with mm. all of those. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So in, in terms of for, for people who are listening to this in the audience and they're like, well, this sounds all amazing. This sounds awesome. I, 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 I want to be, I want to be your best student, Jeff. Um, how, what are some of the, what are some of the steps they can take in order to start to create that mindset? Yeah. So basically the steps that I walk through in the book um, is, is this is, is first of all, where we started understanding manipulation versus persuasion. You've got to change your mindset. You've got to understand that persuasion is leadership. Persuasion is good. And then helping people understand like, how to craft their message. That is one of the main places where we mess up. We have, if, if, you, if you or others are like I am, like all these ideas are bouncing around my head. I've got all these things popping around in, in my head. And sometimes I can just talk, 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 versus like really understanding how we craft a very simple message. And then it's important, like once we get that down, we get a very simple message down, you know, understanding how we create messaging that's sticky, especially if you're in sales. Um, or you're building landing pages. Like we want, we want content that's going to stick with people that like, you know, five days from now, they're still thinking about the conversation with us. They're still thinking about what we talked about. I hope five days from now, your audience is still thinking about me adopting a baby and bringing a baby from uh, the country of Haiti. So it starts with the messaging there. And then it moves to the others like we talked about helping them find their win, helping make a connection. It's like that focus there on the audience. 
we talked a little bit about, about positioning. That's a big part of it as well. Uh, also understanding like how to craft a call to action. Uh, I get 13 easy tips to help people understand how to craft a call to action. And we've got to be, we've got to be you know, intentional in what it is that we're asking people to do. So I get 13 tips for that. Um, another thing in persuasion, and, and this one, you may not even think about this with persuasion, but I think this one sets people apart in persuasion, especially in the business space. And that's becoming an industry expert. Mm. If you can become, set yourself up, and you can, by setting yourself up as an industry expert, people, there's this like magical leap that happens there to you. You're the guru. You're the go-to person in your field and in your space. For me, it's in persuasive communication. I want to be the guru. I want to be the, the go-to person. I want to be Mr. Persuasion, that people know that's what it is that I do. So becoming an industry expert, I have a chapter where we would define like how to do that. And you don't have to be a business owner. You can be inside the company and have your area of expertise in the company that elevates yourself within the company. And one area that we haven't talked about that um, my, my editor and publisher came back to me after I finished the book, they came back and they said this. They said, Jeff, you've kind of talked about, about trust all along, but we really haven't like hit this head on. How important is trust in persuasion? I'm like, oh my gosh, it's the foundation. Here's the thing. Without trust, every single chapter in my book is worthless. Your message doesn't matter. The connection doesn't matter. How you position your call to action, none of that matters without trust. We don't have the foundation. So in the book, I walk through 10 steps of how we build trust with other people. So that's kind of like the spectrum there of, of those that want to study this and understand it a little bit more. Um, but I would highly, highly encourage people to think through this area of trust. Without it, you'll never persuade. Mm, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You had to have some level of trust in me to be able to invite me onto your podcast because you've got a fantastic podcast with tons of people that are listening to you and they're expecting great content. I had to build trust with you to be able to do that. So that's why I say that trust is the foundation and we miss it sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. I think we're too focused on our goals. And when we focus on trusting and some of the things that you know, I think that helps with trust is like just being consistent day in and day out, building consistency with people that are watching us, people that are seeing us, things like delivering as promised. I mean, you want to lose trust with someone, promise them something and then don't deliver <laughs> when or what it is that you said, right? Your yeah. trust goes down and you're going to have, our, if you don't deliver your proposal time, you're going to have a whole lot harder of a time closing that deal, right? Being open and being authentic with people who've talked about that a little bit, showing confidence, like, Knowing what it is that we want, like being confident about that, um, being truthful with people as well. Um, it's hard to believe that we even have to say that, but making sure that we are truthful in our, all of our conversations. Another tip is, is making sure that our audience feels safe with us. And I think that's part of building that relationship with them and that, that we talked about early on is making sure that they feel safe. How about this one? Saying no sometimes. Mm. Doesn't that seem contrary? But actually, it's the best thing that we can do. Sometimes we're not the right match. Sometimes this is not going to be the best way to move forward. And saying, you know, no, I, this product really isn't the best for what you're talking about. But I do know of another product, and here it is over here. This is better served for you. So instead of just trying to make it happen, just being open and just saying no sometimes, be open to feedback, making time for people, and being reliable. Those are my top tips for building trust. Oh, I love them. I absolutely love them. And you're right. Trust is the foundation uh, for, for anything really in life. Um, so yeah, very important that we build trust with, with everybody around us. Um, in terms of actually crafting the message in the business space. So we haven't really talked a, a lot in terms of, you know, how you do that in the business space. So for a lot of people and, and for people in the or um, audience of this channel, they are usually people who are entrepreneurs, they, they own their own business, or they might have a small team they're working with. Um, so for those people, they, they obviously trying to make a bigger breakthrough. And this is what this channel is about. How do you create holistic success? How do you achieve, a, make a bigger impact as a result? So for those people who are, you know, small business owners or they're solo entrepreneurs and they're trying to make a bigger impact, uh, what tips do you have for those guys in terms of how they can craft their message and place themselves as an industry ex expert? Yeah, so crafting your message, 
This is the foundation. And I think so many companies, so many individuals, we mess this up. We miss this opportunity in crafting the message. So um, here, here's some steps. And I, and I quote Albert Einstein starting this, um, who said that if you can't explain something simply, you don't know enough about it. Mm, love can't it. can't explain something simply, you don't know enough about it. And sometimes we, we, we have this thing like, hey, like elevated is, is all so much better and if it sounds stuffy and all that, but people want to understand what it is that you're saying and this is important like to go back to your question like uh, earlier about like proposing or like having that, that person that says i do in our lives like it might be that it, it might be could it might be trying to persuade a person to click through on a landing page for a, mm. a product that we're offering right it might be if entrepreneurs pitching for funding, right? It might be getting that first client. Or how about this? Entrepreneurs trying to make sure they can attract the very best talent. How do we message ourselves around that? I have four steps here that I outline in the book. Easy steps. First of all, is to debrief yourself. So I do this with a legal pad, a big yellow pad. Some people like whiteboards. I will do whiteboards at times as well. We have all this stuff in our head. Get it all out, right? Write it all down. Get everything out there. And then the second thing, this is extremely important for entrepreneurs, with all of this stuff out there, now that you've got everything written out there, and it may take a couple of pages, get it all out there. Don't cross through anything. Just get everything out there. Now look at this and ask yourself this crucial question. And that question is, what problem does this solve? Mm. What problem does this solve? Make sure that you now begin framing it up around what the problem, what this fixes, what this solves. Um, and then the next thing is begin to ask yourself what's crucial. Now we go back to our yellow pad or our whiteboard or however we get all this stuff out of our head. And we look at and we say, okay, what's crucial? What are, what's absolutely necessary and uh, and necessary up front. I talk about an inverted funnel uh, in communication. So instead of the funnel being, you know, top big, the, the top of it being small, like the, a funnel upside down, in which we give the minimal amount of, in, of information possible to get people to take the next step with us. I'll go back to how I introduce myself. Uh, my name is Jeff. I speak professionally. I, I don't give them everything. I give them a little bit of information. So what's the least amount of information you can give them that gives them enough information but makes them want more? So ask what's crucial, then strike everything else, else that's on the, on the pages. Now, I'm not asking you to block it out because we're probably going to use it. That's part of the inverted funnel where you take them down and you give them different levels of information for people who want to go to the next level with you. Hmm. If they're the right match, if things are going ahead in the right direction, they're going to want to know the next part. They're going to want to hear what's on all those pages, but they don't want to hear it all at once. And they don't want to hear it for the first hour after you say hello to them. So debrief yourself, ask what problem this solves, ask yourself what's crucial, strike everything else. And then the fourth thing is this, is to remove all internal or generally unknown jargon. Sometimes we lose a lot of internal technology or terminology, or we'll use acronyms or we'll use things that other people don't know what it means. And sometimes we think it makes us feel smart, but what it often does, it isolates our audience. It builds a barrier to our audience. We don't want any barriers, right? We want to keep it as simple as possible. So anything that the general population or your audience wouldn't necessarily know, explain it up front and then use the acronym, right? Whatever that looks like. But these four steps, if you'll follow of these four steps it will help you take no matter how complicated your message is walk through these four it'll help you take it to something distill it down to something that's very simple that your audience can buy into fantastic and for people in the audience if you are a solo entrepreneur um, or you have a small team working with you then there's some really amazing tips on how you can take your business to the next level how you can craft your message and place yourself as an industry expert I love it Jeff so Jeff tell us uh, a little bit about your book. Um, I know you uh, have already written one and you have another one in the works. So tell us about both and uh, also tell us how people can find out more about you and your books. Absolutely. So uh, my first book is out. It's on helping people to understand how to use the digital space um, to build their, their profile, build their brand, make money online. The second book, um, I'm thrilled with this book. I'm so excited. I've worked over a year on this book. Uh, I have poured myself into this book. Um, as far as I know, I've finished all of my part at, at this point. It's with my editor and my publisher. Um, I've said that a couple of times now, and they pop me back a question or two as we're trying to move through it. So um, I say that with my fingers crossed. Um, how's that? Um, but the book is called Unleashing Your Superpower. 
Mm. My persuasive communication is the only force you will ever need. And here's the big argument that I make in the book is that we all live or die based upon our ability to persuade. And then I, I prove that and I teach people how to do that and how to change their life, how to create the life that they're after by persuasion. Hmm. Awesome. So when is the book expected to come out, Jeff? January. It will be out in January. In fact, um, I will be um, doing like a pre-release at a speaking gig that I'm in St. Martin in January. Um, so we'll be taking some copies there to St. Martin and then it'll be ready for distribution after that. So uh, I'm excited to get it out there. I do think it's going to change lives. I think it's going to help people take life to the next level. Mm, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So Jeff, where, where will the book be available? It comes out in January, which is really exciting. It's not long now. So where, where would it be available? Will it be on Amazon? Will it be on the website? How do we get hold of it? It'll be available on Amazon. If people want to um, get a chapter of it right now, um, they can just text the word persuade to 66866 uh, anywhere. And what will end up happening is they will get a free chapter of my book in their inbox immediately. And then they'll be on the list to get the release information. They can also go to my site, jefftippett.com and it's J-E-F-F-T-I-P-P-E-T-T. -T -T. And if you get any close misspellings, I've got Google ads on my name, all kind of misspellings of my name. So you'll, you'll find me or, you know, speaker from Raleigh, North Carolina, I'll show up that way as well. But you know, check out my website. You can sign up on, the, on my newsletter and it'll also uh, alert you as the book's ready to come out. Fantastic. Um, Jeff, is, is there any other way people can reach out to you directly? Yeah, from my website, they'll find all of my social channels. I'm very active in Facebook. I'm active on LinkedIn. I'm active on Twitter. They connect with me in any of those spaces, carry on conversations, um, ask questions, whatever. I welcome it. I love it. Oh, beautiful. Fantastic, Jeff. So is there anything we can help you with right now? Um, no, I just appreciate the opportunity to talk with you today. You've been a great host. Um, you've asked some fantastic questions and I appreciate the opportunity to share with your audience um, and just get my message out there and hopefully help change lives and help people take the nice, their the life to the next level, live it even you know, more full, but also to all areas of their life, not just the business side of their life. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Um, so for people in the audience, there you have it. Our conversation with Mr. Jeff Tippett, Mr. Persuasion himself. Um, it was an absolute pleasure to have you here, Jeff. It was uh, really enlightening. I mean, we went and we explored a lot um, and I asked you all sorts of questions and I, I've been taking notes. I always do. But uh, again, I will show you guys got a whole page full of notes. Uh, Yay. I hope you guys have been taking notes. This was an absolute gem. Um, Apart from that, I would uh, highly encourage you guys to leave some questions for us. What, what questions do you have for Jeff? What more do you want to know about Jeff, about pers uh, persuasive communication or anything else we have talked about on the show? Leave the questions down below and me and Jeff would love to engage with you. We'd love to know what is it that you're thinking? What are your thoughts? What strategy do you will be implementing? Um, and uh, we'll, we'd love to answer your questions too. So make sure you leave those questions in the, the actual comments down below. Apart from that, make sure you guys subscribe to the channel and uh, it gets you entered into the monthly channel competition where you get a chance to win free access to my latest networking strategies course. These are the exact strategies that I have used to connect with and build relationships with top thought leaders and experts in the world and manage to persuade them to come to my YouTube channel to do this show with you guys. See what I did there? <laughs> yes. So um, make sure you guys subscribe to the channel. Also, all the new episodes will land straight in your inbox. And lastly, the biggest compliment you can pay me and Jeff right now is to just pass, pass it on forward. Pass it on to somebody else who you know will benefit from listening to these ideas, from listening to this conversation, and it will help them enhance their life. We're all about holistic success, not just a narrow tunnel vision, what most people have of our life, but actually a broader, much more holistic understanding of how you can create success in your life. So make sure you share it and pass it on. With that, Jeff, thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate it. Thank you for the time, I appreciate it. Awesome. Guys, stay awesome. Hustle hard, like it says back there, and I will catch you in the next one.